Good evening. As you know, uh, we've been talking uh, about the city's budget for the last several months and are now begin have begun our budgeting process because uh, one of the jobs of um, not only myself but all of our city board members, and first let me just take time to recognize uh, today we have with us city board members, uh, Vice Mayor Wyrick and City uh, Director Ken Richardson are here. I know uh, City Director Joan Atcock will be here shortly. Uh, and as we stand uh, in recognition of all the city board members, uh, as we take on a very serious task uh, in forwarding our city's budget for the 2020 year. Uh, we're trying to do things a bit differently, having as many community meetings as possible uh, so that our community understands the budgeting process, uh, number one, and two, become uh, more educated in that fashion as we move forward to make uh, decisive decisions as being the chief stewards of the taxpayers' dollars. Uh, and so today you will have a uh, brief rundown of our budgeting process from our chief financial officer, Sarah Lenihan, as well as uh, we'll have uh, one of the probably more monumental decisions that we have to make uh, is the changing of our health care um, processes uh, moving forward from our chief people officer and Stacy Witherell and she'll uh, discuss more in detail because we all know that uh, the city is Little Rock's most precious asset is its city employees because without our city employees we cannot uh, run uh, the city of Little Rock uh, and we understand that our customers are its citizens and so we are very serious about that as we move forward. Uh, I am happy to announce uh, that we will have a balanced budget to present to the city board on October the 29th. Uh, we're still working through some things, so it's a work in progress, uh, but we are working he heavily to present a balanced budget uh, to the city board on October 29th. And as we all understand, uh, as being mayor, all I can do is propose a budget. It is up to the city board of directors to dispose of that budget and help make decisions I'm glad that we've been working with every member of the department directors to come up with this, again, I dare say, a balanced budget, which we always appreciate as a balanced budget. And so uh, those are decisions that we've made uh, that will uh, give opportunity to the city board of directors to weigh in in their direct capacity uh, because no budget can be, uh, be uh, in operation without uh, a passage by the city board. And so we wanted to give opportunity a bit differently that we start early uh, with our budgeting process uh, so as many questions can be asked as we move forward and being chief stewards of those dollars. So I do again uh, want to take this time to acknowledge the city directors that are here. Uh, thank you for the community members uh, here at Southwest Little Rock Community Center somewhere that I think we all know I love very dearly this, uh, this particular area and we wanted to have this community meeting here and we are looking forward to Sarah Linehan's um, budget presentation as well as Stacy Witherell and then after that we'll open the floor for any questions again uh, it's our plan to um, on October 29th again it's a work in progress Rachel so it's not complete yet uh, but to have uh, a, a final budget on October 29th and once we get that Rachel you will get it as well so no need to ask for it early um, <laughs> but that being said our chief financial officer Sarah Linehan Thank you, Mayor. It's a pleasure to be here with you all tonight. Um, if you've been following the city board meetings, you may have heard some of the things that I'm going to share with you this evening. Um, but uh, I do want to expand just a little bit on what the mayor said. And, and while he said we are working to present a draft budget to the city board on October 29th, um, and, and it will be balanced, um, we are also working very hard to make that a sustainable balanced budget where the um, expenditures can be covered with recurring ongoing revenues. Um, in, the, in the past few years, we have had to draw upon some one-time sources of revenue in order to balance our budget or one-time reductions in expenses, and that's just not a sustainable model. As you all understand, when you're balancing your household's expenses, you don't want to get into house payments or utility payments where you don't have recurring revenue to offset that. You can't do that with one-time money. And so that's been the mayor's primary objective, and we're working to make sure that whatever we present to the board of directors is a sustainable 
ongoing um, balanced model. So um, get started. Um, I thought it was very important to share with you um, the executive administration, which includes the, the mayor, the city manager, um, and the board of directors, have, have established these uh, priorities as their, their goals. So those include quality of life, um, housing, which includes safe neighborhoods, uh, public safety, which includes police, fire, code enforcement, the community programs that we provide, um, infrastructure, uh, which includes not only your streets, roads, bridges, but the buildings um, that the city has. Um, education, as you all are aware, uh, Little Rock School District um, has been returned uh, to the city uh, control and the mayor is very focused on um, working with the State Board of Education, Little Rock School District, and the community to uh, provide some uh, community school uh, improvements and, and wraparound services around our, our schools. Um, economic development is another uh, major focus of the city. So um, just an overview of how we go about establishing our balanced budget. Um, the baseline for the 2020 budget is going to be the 2019 um, adopted budget as it was adjusted um, on June 4th. But on June 4th, when we made the adjustment to the budget, we only put in a half year adjustment because those, those adjustments took effect beginning in July for the remainder of the year. The baseline for the 2020 budget takes those adjustments that we made and annualizes them to be in effect for the entire year. Um, the mayor established a goal of adopting the budget by the end of November with these public information and discussion sessions throughout the process. Um, we uh, do have a goal of adopting the budget at the end of November, and as we've discussed, we hope to present um, a balanced option for the board to begin considering on the 29th of October. Uh, the board began holding initial policy discussions regarding their concerns and the desires for their budget at the August 27th meeting. Since then, we've had several meetings. Um, we've had, we had another discussion on September 10th following the agenda meeting. Uh, the focus kind of turned to health care options because that's such a large part of our budget. Um, it's really second uh, to our employee salaries. It may be the second largest uh, single expenditure of the city is our health insurance. Um, we had our first citizen communication discussion on September 30th at the center at University Park and we're here tonight with you. Um, ongoing budget discussions occurred during the board's uh, policy meetings, which they hold each, uh, every other Tuesday, immediately following their agenda meetings. So um, when establishing the budget, the first thing we do is we do our revenue forecasting. Um, our treasury manager has now received projections uh, from the different department directors on any of the fees or permits charged by the city, also on those revenues that the city generates, say from the zoo or anything where you might pay a fee to, to uh, receive a service. Um, we also receive projections from our utility providers. About 14% of the city's revenue comes from franchise fees. Those are fees derived off the utility bills um, for the use of the city's infrastructure. Most of the utilities uh, carve into the city's infrastructure in order to uh, do their utility lines. And so this franchise fee is their way of comp compensating the city for use of our right of way. So we receive estimates from energy, from um, uh, the gas utility, um, we, we receive estimates from Little Rock Wastewater, from Central Arkansas Water, that take into account any rate adjustments that have been approved. We never include pending rate adjustments. So if someone has, is going to go before the Public Service Commission for a rate increase and that has not been fully approved, we're not going to incorporate that. We only include known rate um, adjustments. Then the Treasury Manager also has been working with uh, the County Assessor's Office to get a feel for our property tax assessments and what, how we think those are going to change. Um, he also works with the State Department of Finance and Administration in order to uh, come up with our sales tax projections. 
those revenues, and I want to I want to mention this because it really is complex. We have so many different revenue sources. When you think about all the ser services that the city provides, and those are tracked monthly for all types of revenue, so that we can try to uh, analyze trends, forecast um, changes. Some things are are a little bit out of our control. They're very dependent on the weather. If you think about our zoo revenues, even a lot of the utility revenues. The, the utilities will forecast franchise fees for us, but if we have an unusually um, mild summer or a very wet spring, that can really affect the amount of, of, of water use that citizens have. They may not need to water their lawns or uh, they may not need to turn on their air conditioners as early. They may not run their heaters as long. So all that has an impact on the city's revenues. Um, just to share one other thing that occurred to us um, in 2018, um, the utilities had approved rate increases that had gone through the Public Service Commission process. All of those rates were in place. They communicated to the city what those forecasts were. Well, then at the national level, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act passed. Well, you wouldn't think that has an effect on local revenues in Little Rock, Arkansas, but the tax credits that were afforded um, the large utility companies, our governor, said, okay, you know, you were approved rate increases for cost recovery purposes based on what your bottom line looked like. But now that you're getting these big tax credits, you may not need those rate increases. So we want you to go back to the Public Service Commission and have those looked at again. Well, as a result, those rate increases were not only reversed, but customers were given credits for anything they had paid from the time that rate increase went into effect until um, the, the uh, rates were actually reversed. So if you go home tonight and you pull out your energy bill and you take a look at it, you'll see there's a credit on there for the Tax Cut and Jobs Act adjustment. And those will continue for citizens through the end of December of this year. Uh, it's already expired for the businesses. But that tax credit really reduced the city's revenue because our franchise fee is based on total revenue for energy. If they're not collecting revenue, they're reducing customer bills, then our franchise fees are also going down. And that was totally out of our control. Um, another uh, fund of the city is the city's waste disposal fund. C customers are charged to service for uh, trash and recycling. Um, and for bulky item uh, pickup, it's all rolled into one rate. Um, the city had not adjusted rates since 2004. And um, so we recently had a waste disposal rate study. And uh, they presented a, a recommendation. There's going to be some changes that will be effective in January. Um, I know, for example, uh, bulky item pickup will move to a one-time free pick up and then beyond that there will be um, I think a $25 charge if you uh, need to have an additional pick up. But the rates will be adjusted um, effective in January. There was a presentation made to the board on that in August. Uh, the ordinance to implement those rate in, that rate change, the rate increase was uh, adopted at the September 17th board meeting. And then um, another piece of that that has not yet um, been decided uh, is the glass recycling. I think many of you who do recycle are aware that uh, they eliminated glass recycling this past year and we're no longer allowed to do that. We've gone out for a separate bid for glass recycling. The bids closed October 16th and actually this afternoon the committee to analyze the bids was scheduled to meet. So I don't have any information yet on the results of that. But um, the intent is that if the city um, opts to move forward with glass recycling and that's something the board wants to implement that we would try to make that effective at the same time in January. So once we get our revenues forecasted and we determine how much money is available by fund and again the city um, you may not be aware the city operates we actually have 47 different funds. Um, the general fund is the one that we talk about the most we're the most familiar with and that's the fund that holds our police services, our fire services, our parks and recreation activities, um, and what you might consider overhead, the HR department, finance department, information technology, um, the city attorney's office, housing neighborhood programs, all of those things are primarily in the general fund. Um, the 
the other two largest funds we have are our waste disposal fund, which is operated more like a business where there's an actual charge for service. The general fund revenues are primarily tax-based revenues, and that's where you don't pay a fee in, um, on your own for your personal police officer. You pay taxes, and if you need police or fire services, they're delivered <laughs> to you. Um, so waste disposal is, is more like a business. We also have a street fund, and the primary sources of revenue from that fund are um, turn back funds and levies that, are, that are come from the county or the state that are restricted for only streets, roads, bridges, right of way um, type activities. The other funds that the city maintains have to do with um, capital improvement projects. We may have bond issues for certain types of capital improvement projects. We have the 38 cent sales tax that's restricted for um, the capital projects that, that voters approved. Um, we have debt service funds. Whenever we have a capital improvement fund, we typically have a bond issue or something that's tied to that. We have a dedicated property tax levy or some source of revenue that goes to repayment of those bonds, and all those are kept in sev separate funds. We also have multiple pension funds. So that's just to give you an idea. Um, and all those, all those revenues are kept separately from uh, the general fund activities. The general fund is the one fund that is not restricted beyond any other um, external source. That's the name general. So once we get all those revenues forecasted and we know how much is available for uh, expenditure, we begin working on our expenditure budget. So um, the largest, uh, almost 75% of the general fund budget is personnel. And so we go through some very complicated um, processes, pulling information from our payroll system and benefits data that gets down to the level of, you know, what employee, what each employee actually has uh, selected as their benefits, whether they have single insurance coverage or family insurance coverage, which pension plan they belong to, which union they may belong to, if they're in the police union or the fire union or the AFSCME union. Um, there are different step and grades, there's different salary schedules depending on which employee uh, group you are associated with. So we pull that data in. We get uh, the pension rates from the state regarding lot fee or APERS. Our judges and, and court clerks are in the APERS system. Our police and fire are in the lot fee system. And those rates are determined outside the city. Um, in addition to that, we have a non-uniform defined benefit plan, and those rates are, are established by our actuary who evaluates that and determines what the city, uh, what, what level of contribution is required to, to maintain the health of that plan. That plan is split where the city uh, contributes twice the amount the employee contributes. So the city currently contributes 9%, the employee contributes 4.5% and that provides a benefit for the non-uniform employees at retirement. Then as we mentioned, health insurance is the next largest expense associated with our personnel. Um, the city has been working hard, I'm not gonna talk a lot about this because Stacy will in just a minute, but to um, figure out our health uh, plan for next year, our initial estimates came in at over 24% increase, which was obviously not something that the city could bear. Um, that was negotiated down to a proposed 15% in increase. The city has also uh, evaluated a uh, self-funded model. Um, th those options have been presented to the board. Um, a recommendation has been made by staff, and that item is actually on the agenda for a reconvened meeting that will take place on the 29th for the board to consider. Um, in addition, we have something called other post-employment benefits. Um, those are benefits that employees have um, past retirement that is not pension. So um, there, we, especially with police and fire, many of them retire before age 65, move on to another um, career, and this is, um, these are primarily related to health benefits that they are able to receive up until they're um, 65 years of age. Um, we also have workers' compensation funding, that's a self-funded plan, unemployment, and many other uh, personnel-related costs. So that information is pulled down for all of our, our full-time employees. We uh, evaluate the step and grade schedules. We look at potential rate increases. Um, 
and put all that into our model to establish our personnel cost. Um, then uh, the next area that we have to look at is our outside agencies. So the city uh, partners with several agencies that are not um, part of the core primary government, but they provide additional services associated with the city. So for example, um, we pay the regional uh, county detention facility to house our prisoners. Well, um, we negotiated, uh, initially the county wanted to uh, double our, our contribution, more than double our contribution. Um, they came up with a formula that charged a check-in fee in addition to a daily fee for prisoners that they held, and that was going to uh, really double to more than double our, our jail fee. All of the um, mayors in the county got together, took a look at that, and said that's just not something that we can, we can handle. We really need to evaluate this and continue our longstanding partnership and work on a solution that we can all manage. So um, Mayor Scott led the charge and has negotiated a 25% increase for next year. Um, and then the cities are going to work with the county, have an audit of the jail, including their expenses and their revenue, and really see what we need to do in order to um, provide adequate funding to maintain the jail. So that will increase um, almost a half a million dollars to uh, 2479000 in the city's budget next year. Um, another really large expenditure the city has is with Rock Region Metro. Uh, they provide the um, bus service and the paratransit service um, for our citizens. That is a, um, an interlocal agreement with the county, with the city of North Little Rock, with Sherwood, Maumel, there's other partners. Um, and so the cost of that service is divided up based on the center line miles of service that the city receives. So every bus route that runs, the frequency that it runs, the miles that it covers, all that goes into the model to figure out how the total cost is divided up. And so um, we've had a couple of uh, budget committee meetings. The uh, Rock Region Metro's budget committee will actually present their recommended budget to the Rock Region Metro board tomorrow at their board meeting. Um, the, the number that they have plugged in right now for the city of Little Rock is about 10.2 million. Um, our art center funding uh, is a minimum of 700,000 annually. Um, currently the art center is under construction. They are operating out of the um, old Walmart off of uh, La Harp Cantrell, I'm not sure what it's called right there. <laughs> but. Um, and so the city will continue to provide the, the, the minimum 700,000 required for that. Uh, I will say that this is one of the items that in the 2019 budget, for temporarily, this uh, we used the 1% hotel tax charge that was going to be dedicated to the, the art center bonds that were issued, that voters approved. Those bonds had not yet been issued in 2000 um, and 19 or in 2000, excuse me, in 2018 when the budget was adopted, those bonds had not yet been issued and so the money that had been collected prior to the end of the year was used to fund the art center during 2019. But none of the collections in the current year or in the future can go to that because they're dedicated to those bonds. And now that the art center um, bond project is under construction and the bonds have been issued, those revenues must go to that bond. Um, in addition to uh, our expenditure planning, we look at grant opportunities. And so there are several grants that the city participates on. Some of those are formula-based um, that have to do with our, the number of citizens or, um, or budgets for different things. And um, others are competitive grants. And so the city competes for many grants each year. And our grants manager works with the departments to find out what their, what their plans are to make sure that we have match money designated in order to be successful in obtaining those grants. Um, if you already have your match money set aside, if you've uh, got the policies in place that are necessary, then you're more competitive in winning those grants. And that goes a long way of extending the resources that are available to the city. Um, the mayor, uh, had requested when he first came in to have a program performance review of city services and that is in the final stages. I think recommendations will be presented to um, 
the, the mayor and the board uh, soon. There was an outside contractor auditing firm that specializes in this type of performance review, and they're wrapping up that um, as we speak. Um, and then finally, we, we reach out to each department and we say, what, what are your needs that you don't have in your current budget? Or what are your aspirational goals? What would you do? Um, what, are you, what do you need looking down the road? An example, fire department may say, I need another fire station, you know, down the road. This is something else I need. And so those are things that we look at <clears throat> from, the, from the different departments. Um, the mayor also asked for uh, information about contracts and for the number, number of managers and supervisors within each department to evaluate that. So I mentioned at the beginning that our baseline for the 2020 budget was going to be our original adopted budget with the annualized adjustments um, that were adopted on June 4th. So the amount that you see in that middle column is not the actual adjustment. This is the annualized impact of the adjustment. So when we did our budget amendment on June 4th, the issue was um, the city had adopted a balanced budget in 2019, but that budget included a lot of one-time revenue and transfers. As we mentioned, they were only going to be available one time. There were some temporary expenditure reductions that were in the budget. One of those was the art center that we mentioned. That didn't have to come from the general fund last year because we had an alternative revenue source, but we only had it available one time. So um, when the mayor took office, he asked me about um, the city's status moving forward, and, and I told him that one of my concerns was that we did have these one-time items in the budget and that that would not sustain the salary increases um, that we had granted for police and fire primarily, but other ongoing operations that we had in our 2019 budget. And so he decided that we, we really needed to, to take a look at that um, during 2019 so that we were in a good place beginning the 2020 budget process. So um, in that process, one of the things we did was we looked at our revenues. The, uh, during the legislature this past year, um, they, the uh, legislature passed a new bill that does now finally require when you buy things online that they collect and remit local sales tax whether or not they have a presence in the state. In the past, if you were to say go online and buy something from Walmart, they would charge you tax because Walmart operates in Arkansas. But if you were to go online and buy from um, Wayfair or Amazon or, or someplace else, if they didn't have a presence in Little Rock, or I mean not Little Rock, but Arkansas, they would not collect and remit local tax. Well, what happened was um, people might go down to Best Buy, window shop, figure out what, what kind of a TV they needed, use those resources, use those local retailers, and then go online and not pay the tax. Um, so, uh, it was just, it was unfair to our local businesses, and I think that was one of the things that legislators wanted to address. But the other thing is, it's such a convenience. The more that people were buying online, it really took away from the resources and from the growth that the city had, and that made it very next to impossible to continue to provide police and fire and, and ongoing services, because those costs were not dwindling at the same time that those sales tax revenues were. So with the passage of that act, the forecast that the state gave for the increase in the Little Rock sales tax was $780,000. We believe we're probably going to exceed that and we are forecasting a little bit more than that in our budget for next year, but that was the, the recommendation from the state. And so our budget amendment on an annualized basis um, anticipated that. Charges for services were reduced. Um, as you're probably aware, um, before, I guess during 2018, when we were looking at the 2019 budget, the Board of Directors requested that we do a review of our golf services. We were operating four golf courses, and demand just did not uh, equate to the need to continue to maintain four golf courses. So um, we had an independent study that reviewed the golf courses and recommend that we take the total number of city golf courses down from four to two. 
and um, the board uh, reviewed those results. The mayor made a recommendation, and so two of our four golf courses were closed. This uh, reduction is the combination of the reduced revenue and also then the increase in revenue at the Jim Daly Fitness Center and a couple of other places from, from charges for services. So that's a net adjustment. Um, then with our expenses, we made several uh, expenditure reductions in each department. In general administration, um, a part of that, uh, one of the larger parts of that reduction was um, the reclassification of part of our Rock Region Metro funding from the general fund to the street fund. We moved about half a million dollars from the general fund to the street fund. Transportation is an eligible use of street, form, uh, street fund revenues. And um, as the, de the demand and the burden has increased, um, we decided we needed to take advantage of that other revenue source. Um, there were some other reduction in outside agency funding. Um, there was a, a small reduction in the Museum of Discovery funding and in the Downtown Partnership funding. And then there was a position that was eliminated um, in general administration and administrative position. As you move down the line there, most of those reductions are associated with the elimination of personnel. There were two positions, uh, vacant attorney positions that were eliminated. There was an accountant position eliminated um, and, and so on, a planner in, in planning and development. Um, one of the hardest hit departments obviously was parks and recreation. Um, there were several positions eliminated, although most of the staffing I believe almost all of the park staffing were reassigned to other vacant positions within either the public works or the waste disposal fund. Um, the, uh, so we, we reduced a lot of the parks and rec expenses. That's net of increasing some of the contract expenses for land maintenance and that type of thing, but that kind of right-sized the, um, the total parks department budget. In golf, that, that reduction represents the reduction of two golf courses. Um, in the zoo, the, the thing, there were no positions eliminated in the zoo, but what the zoo decided to do was to reduce their hours of operation from November to February when it's very cold, very few people attend the zoo, or not nearly as many people attend the zoo. Um, they're going to be closed, I believe it's on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So um, we don't believe that that's really gonna have a negative impact on revenue because citizens will still be able to go to the zoo the other five days a week. Um, but those two days, that reduction will reduce some of the expenses for guest services. Um, the fire department reduced a few expenses. They reduced a, um, a non-uniform position um, that I think helped to deliver equipment. Um, in the police department, there were some administrative, a couple of administrative positions that were eliminated. Housing and neighborhood programs, there were some uh, community center, um, I'm trying to think what the, what the title was, were they? Neighborhood, neighborhood Resource Center Specialists. Specialists. Um, and so there were, um, I believe, 11 or 12, and that number was taken down by five. So many of them were then assigned to two neighborhood resource centers as, as opposed to one. That was the primary reduction in community programs. So all that said, um, the annualized impact of the net of both the increase in revenues and the decrease in expenses was um, $3,743,000 uh, of, of net expense that was taken out of the budget. And then we also reduced our transfers out. And so there were some special projects, some transfers that were there. Um, the two, two large items here, the annualized impact or the um, community programs funding, we allocate $5.5 million. So the annual impact of that is 750,000 redu reduction. And then there was um, a cities of service uh, project that was reduced by, um, I think the remaining budget there is gonna be 155,000. It was taken down by I think about Nine, um, uh, can't remember, about 90,000 maybe. So anyway, the combination of all of that 
uh, put back into the budget four million five hundred ninety thousand, and the intent the intent again was to offset the impact of all those one-time items that were used in 2019, so that we would be starting with um, a budget where our recurring revenues and our recurring expenditures match and building from there. So um, here it's just showing you the June 4th amendment was actually 2,274,000. The annualized adjustment again is the 4,590, or it's actually almost 5 million. The 360,000 that shows there for the first T, because the golf study was underway, the city did not fund the full annual allocation for the first T in the adopted budget that was dropped down to just 120,000. So when, you, when you're comparing that, when you take the 360 that would have been in the annual out, we got to that 5 million. Um, the net savings by eliminating the two golf courses was about $642,000 to the budget that the, that the city was having to uh, sustain. So that really um, tells you kind of how we go about amending the budget or uh, about adopting the budget. And um, as I mentioned, we've, been, we've come a long way since our last presentation. While this presentation is very similar to the last presentation, um, we have been gathering a lot of those numbers. We've gotten most of those numbers in from our, our external sources where we, we need information from the state or the county or our franchising partners. Um, and so all of that's being compiled along with the um, personnel model and the projections for our costs. And then as we bring that together, we take a look at, you know, do we have a gap? Do our revenues match our expenditures? Is there something we need to reduce or reallocate? Is there, um, have we adequately, you know, accounted for all of our revenues? Is there anything that we need to take another look at um, and adjust? And so that's the stage we're in. And as I mentioned, we're, we're planning to try to present a balanced recommendation to the board on the 29th that they can then make adjustments as they, uh, you know, as they see things that they want us to include. Um, but as I mentioned, when we had the first initial strategy session with the board, a lot of their uh, ideas or wants or wishes have been taken into account and incorporated into the um, budget that we will be presenting. So um, our public sessions, the two that were officially scheduled were September 30th and this one tonight. We'll have additional meetings um, as needed. Um, typically, we try to do those on a Monday night um, or, or as where it fits within the mayor's schedule. And then our target date for adoption is Tuesday, November 19th. But of course, we have by, by city uh, statute, we have up until December 30th, but we are required um, by ordinance to adopt a balanced budget by December 30th. So. Um, that's all I have to share right now until we open it up for questions, but I'm gonna invite Stacy up so she can tell you a little bit about the health insurance. Good evening. Health insurance, um, and really just to kind of emphasize some of the points that Sarah already made, um, health care is very important because not only is it our second largest expense to um, personnel salaries, it also is a major component to our compensation package that we offer our city employees. And so that impacts our ability to attract and retrain, and I'm sorry, attain, sorry, retain. <laughs> Um, employees so that's why it's just a important topic that um, deserves great conversation and discussion and consideration by the board the mayor city manager and I we did make a recommendation to the board and it is um, on the agenda for October 29th as Sarah mentioned um, and the recommendation is to stick with United Healthcare with a fully insured product for 2020 and this will allow us to um, build a reserve um, for hopes of going self-insured in 2021. So during 2020, um, employees have a responsibility um, of taking care of their health and improving their health so that we can hopefully have um, great claims 
number so that when we go out to market for 2021, we get a, um, a renewal that fits within our constraints of our 2021 budget. So um, again, at this time, the fully insured program um, is at a cost of 15% um, of our current um, expenditures, um, estimating about 13 million for our 2020 budget. Um, the, the change will result in us changing platforms for our employees. We're going from what's called a River Valley platform to a legacy platform, and there's various changes in the benefits with those. Um, but regardless of the product that we go to, employees will be given all the information. Um, there's a communication plan that's being proposed so that employees clearly understand what the changes are so that they can make good decisions for their health care coverage moving forward. The current cost sharing proposal is that the city will pay 50% of the increase with the employee picking up the remaining 50%, resulting in a charge to them per month of about $34. So that is a, a pre-tax amount, um, so they should not realize the entire $34 per month, but it is a change in our current compensation system where the city picks up 100% of the employee coverage. So um, again, it's a very important um, benefit to the employees, but it's also um, a very important component of the city's budget in being able to afford um, an insurance package that is beneficial to the employees and that we can actually afford as well. So um, that is going to go before the board on October the 29th. Um, again, fully insured so that we are protected um, from any unexpected claims um, that a fully or a self-insured product, um, the city would be taking on that risk. So again, it provides us with the protection that we need so that we can use 2020 to really build our reserves so that we can look at um, going self-funded in the future. Are there any questions about the community, the health care proposal? Yes, Director Adcock. Stacy, there are lots of city employees here tonight, and you're saying that the board is going to vote on this on October the 29th, and yet the city employees are not going to see all the details of this until after the board votes on it. Is that correct? That is correct, um, Director Adcock. The, um, the health care package is not normally um, shared with the employees prior to the board approving it. We do take it to the health care task force and we do take it to the union so that they are aware of the changes that are being um, proposed. I know what is usual. I've had 28 years of it, so I know what is usual. This is the first time we have ever asked the employees to pay some. Secondly, you made the statement that we're changing platforms and to the majority of the employees, and until I've researched it, I didn't know either. A platform is your benefits, and the benefits under the new platform are less than under the old platform. So there, there are changes, Director Adak, not to, and I gave you that, um, that document. Um, under the legacy, it also includes house calls, where the current platform does not have um, house calls. Physician house calls. Well, I think when I counted, there was five that was lesser, but regardless if it's one less or whatever, I would like for the employees to see the changes before I am asked to vote on it. Because a lot of my voting is done by the recommendation of citizens and employees. So I would like to request that the employees see the change of those platforms before I'm asked to vote on it. Director Adcott, uh, as you know, uh, number one, anytime in a health insurance platform, generally uh, the enrollment period is in the month of October. Uh, we look through this process for the entire year, and quite frankly, when you have 25% increase that you can't afford, and we were thankful that Stevens Insurance was able to negotiate it down to 15%, and we made a decision. Uh, and part of that decision is, once the myself and the board make a decision, then all of that information is given to all the employees because we have all the accurate information. Until we make a decision, there's nothing to share with the employees. Now, understanding that, we're now, because we wanted the board to 
have an opportunity to digest uh, this monumental change. And we have to understand also that health insurance is evolving. It's evolving in the private sector, it's evolving in state government, it's evolving in city government across this nation. And so we will be making a decision on October the 29th. Uh, we have another uh, reason not to, and also uh, we're already running behind as it relates to enrollment now. I understand that, Mayor, but I also would like for the employees to know what the changes are in case they want to go and Employees are receiving that information through the health care task force, and they'll have all the accurate information once the decision's been made. We may just have to agree to disagree. Maybe so. But I Thank you so I much. I do have a copy of it, and if the employees would like to see it, I'll be happy to share my copy. Please share it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, if you want to come to the mic. Ms. Carla. Oh. Oh, yes, please. Hi. Hi. My name is Carla Coleman with the Our Neighborhood Association. I do not work for the city, but I do have uh, a family member who gets insured uh, with the city benefits. And I want to know what other group insurances are you looking at to reduce um, you know, the, the city's expenses, because from, it sounds like the city is trying to save money in order to insure um, the city employees. So what other companies are you looking at so that it could be a, more affordable to the citizens and the, and the, uh, the city? Well, actually, the, the product that we're discussing, the United Healthcare Fully Insured Legacy um, platform that is the cheapest renewal that we received an RFP or request for proposal was submitted um, we only got um, a few proposals back um, and once those were analyzed and those uh, renewal rates were compared they were more expensive so I mean we did look at various fully insured options as well as self-insured options and this was the cheapest Yes. 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 Any other questions? Thank you. Well, I just want to thank Stacy and Sarah. Oh, yeah. We're getting ready to get to that. <laughs> we just wanted to give Stacy the opportunity to sit down. Um, one, I, I want to always be conscious of everyone's time, and thank you so much for everyone coming out. Uh, now we're going to shift towards uh, Q and A. Uh, as uh, state, state, Sarah has already spent a considerable amount of time talking about the budget, again, uh, we're excited uh, that uh, by October the 29th, we will be able to propose uh, to the city board a balanced budget that includes um, revenues and expenses that match, occurring revenues and expenses that match going forward uh, to continue to create sustainability and solvency. Uh, for all of our uh, citizens and our, our assets within the city of Little Rock. Uh, there had been a lot of decisions to be made uh, to get us to this point. I just want to applaud uh, Sarah, Stacy, Anita, uh, the entire finance HR team, and all of the department directors that played a role in developing this budget, uh, that it will be a balanced budget to propose to the city board of directors. Again, it's a uh, proposal to the city board of directors so they can weigh in as well. Uh, a part of the process uh, as we move forward uh, to have a balanced budget uh, for us all to be chief stewards of the taxpayers dollars. Um, clearly uh, there are a lot of things that have been made and when you have uh, historic decisions that have been made to get you to this point you have to make hard decisions to continue to move forward uh, and a lot of the times there are economic realities. I think anyone that owns a business or works within a business at a high level understand that health care expenses are generally somewhere between 20 to 25 percent of uh, anyone's uh, organizational budget and plays a critical role in the budget and helps make other decisions on how you invest in the future for your organization uh, as it is with us here at our um, organization right now uh, where we face the 25 percent increase that was eventually negotiated down to 15 percent which is real dollars uh, to the city of Little Rock, close to $2 million that we have to add to the budget for health care uh, just to keep it at the cheapest level right now uh, so we can take care of our most precious assets, which are our city employees. And so we've gotten down to that particular point. 
And so now we want to open the floor for any uh, Q&A. We do have, uh, I want to make sure that anytime we have community meetings, particularly about the budget, uh, that I have uh, our city department uh, directors with us. Uh, so you have opportunity to ask questions. And if I can't answer, I'm sure one of our city directors uh, that will be here. Uh, we have our chief of uh, police and fire, as well as our public works, housing, uh, HR finance, parks, zoo, everyone. So our city attorney's here as well. Fleet, IT, yes ma'am, planning. Mayor, I've sat and listened to the, the expenditure report and I don't see where the, um, the increase of almost $8 for garbage collection or whatever you all could put that under for starting in January is really justifiable. Now, I'm sure that there are people in certain parts of the city have no problem with increases of that nature. But that seems to be um, a little short-sighted to add that amount at one time all of a sudden. Now, I, I'll use myself as an example. Yes, ma'am. With the digital newspaper that Arkansas Democrat uh, is now doing, I don't have that much uh, recycle anymore. So it, for me, that recycle cost is really unnecessary. Now, I know, I looked at the people who voted against that increase and everything, and I can appreciate those people for um, maybe understanding that that was uh, unnecessary to many of us. It just doesn't, you know, cut the, it just seems like it could have been a lesser amount even if it had to be split up over a period of time or something. Now, you know, um, telling me that it had been raised in six or seven years was not necessarily a real good justification, you know? Yes, ma'am. I think that um, the um, people in the um, recycle, not recycle, well, the recycle office, wherever that is, ought to look at what what is it going to cost now to maintain that operation if the amount that they are having to uh, recycle is less than it was when you all started your budget cycle. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, John, if you'll come here just for a few specifics that I may or uh, may not leave out. Uh, first, to answer your question in regards to recycling, uh, that contract was taken, that was issued uh, back in 2018. Uh, and that contract with recycling has to do with uh, the cities of North Little Rock and the city of Little Rock. And quite frankly, even with that contract, uh, due to the economy, at one point in time, it was uh, $2.96 for the city of Little Rock and North Little Rock. Uh, and quite frankly, it was low compared to our peers in the, in the South. And so waste man management levied uh, us an increase from $2.96 to $4.14 for every citizen um, in Little Rock and North Little Rock. And so in those, and when you're dealing with economies of scale and contracting at this point in time, uh, we can't pick and choose uh, because X resident does not use recycling, but Y resident does. And so it's a levy that's uh, taken upon all of us. And so that's the reason uh, from a recycling standpoint. Now, from a waste management standpoint, uh, there are a number of different reasons in addition to uh, it was not just six years that they have not had an increase to take care of the, ex the existing expenses that have been la levied on the waste disposal. It actually had been about 14 years, close to 20 uh, since the last time. We've been dealing with the same uh, amount of employees to deal with additional services. And on top of that, uh, we've been dealing with a lack of employees due to a number of our employees leaving, going to other cities because of a lack of pay. Uh, and then on top of that, we've had uh, somewhere between 10 to 15% uh, of our citizens uh, that are, over, are abusing uh, a number of different services uh, that have brought on a, a lot more additional costs. 
And so that's conceptually the, the, the reasons why we had to go towards that increase. Uh, believe me, that's not something anyone uh, takes lightly. Uh, John and I were just talking about uh, what that increase looks like in a, in a way of also understanding that um, the water utility bills have also increased as well uh, this year, as well as the energy and things of that nature. So it definitely is not something that we took lightly and understand that uh, it, it will be additional expense and it's one of those decisions that we had to make. John? The land, oh yeah, Did you talk about the landfill? Uh, well, certainly uh, some of the other expenses that, that this rate increase has incorporated into it over the next 10 years is uh, expansion of our, the city's landfill. We operate uh, the landfill that the residential trash that's collected in the city uh, it gets placed in the landfill that we operate. Uh, that landfill has to be expanded as uh, trash continues to be placed into it. Uh, this rate increase incorporated into it the costs uh, in the future years, in the future 10 years, uh, to pay for that expansion of the landfill. Uh, we build up a, a, uh, a fund, uh, a reserve that allows us to pay for those uh, when those costs come due versus uh, other forms of uh, borrowing money or other ways to do that. We would prefer to have that cash uh, in our uh, fund where we can pay for that when we need to. Uh, I was trying to think of anything else. That, 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 I don't think so. Uh, well, sure. I mean, uh, in equipment, when you think about uh, not raising rates for 14, 15 years or longer, uh, the costs associated with, with operating, collecting garbage and operating the landfill have, have increased over that time. Uh, we've done the best that we could possibly do during that time frame without any of those increases to continue to provide the services that we could. Uh, equipment over time uh, wears out, has to be replaced. The cost of those equipment, trucks uh, and, and other things, that's steadily increased over that 15 year period. Uh, so part of that rate increase is to help offset the increased cost uh, with providing the service through employee uh, uh, salaries and benefits, equipment increase in costs for that, uh, the increase in maintenance, the increase in fuel. There, there's a lot of things that, that have occurred over that 15-year period that, that uh, we used in projecting for the next 10 years what rate increase we need to stay solvent and stay uh, above board when it comes to uh, the revenue that we have to operate the, the landfill and the garbage collection service. More questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, well, actually, uh, you're next. Come on up. Yeah. If you got questions, just come up to the mic. <laughs> Please. Good evening. My name is Vera Three, and I've been a longtime resident of Southwest Little Rock since 1991. And my question has to do with the uh, PIT yes, funding. Um, I've heard that that funding is going to be cut and uh, possibly put into the schools, which I think is a wonderful idea. But as we know, PIT, prevention, intervention, and treatment dollars, are very, very necessary in my opinion because they, uh, through community-based and faith-based organizations, they have programs for children, youth, and families, everything from year-round and summer uh, programs, summer uh, after-school programs, um, in the past, substance abuse treatment programs for children and families, uh, domestic violence programs, uh, work, uh, job and reentry programs, and, and all of that. And my concern is that I've heard that that funding is going to be cut uh, drastically and um, if we do put um, those programs more into the schools, which I think is a wonderful idea, what about those kids who are not connected to a school, who depend on the community-based or the face-based programs to get them and their families connected to the needed resources? Yes, ma'am, thank you so much for that question and sharing your concern. Uh, I can definitely share with you, number one, uh, that the community programs budget uh, is not being cut. Uh, now, it, has, it was cut in the June 4th uh, budget cut along with other agencies to uh, get our finances in order back on, in June 4th, but the community uh, programs budget is not being cut at all, so whoever shared that with you uh, did not have accurate information. 
Uh, number two, uh, while it's not being cut, cut we are going to be targeting uh, dollars uh, to help our schools uh, in creating a community school model. Um, we have not decided what that specific amount will be, uh, but it will not have uh, a drastic impact on the current services that are being performed with prevention, intervention, and treatment dollars. But there will be a targeted amount of dollars that will go towards our uh, Little Rock School District. Really, and I hate to say to the school district, but particularly to the student. We're going to make sure those dollars go to the student to help create the community school model. So who shared that with you? Just let them know they were incorrect. Ms. Carlin. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Trash. Garbage. Recycle. Have, uh, has anybody um, thought about um, the dumping increasing? Now, if we can't police the uh, slum lords, the neighbors that constantly are paid for uh, cleaning up these houses and areas and whatever and bringing it home and putting it in front of their house and it has to sit there weekly, monthly, and then I'm looking at the storm. So we're paying for increases, but are the services going to increase? The services, because I see this all the time. Um, our services are just poor. Um, when we had the storms back in the early part of the, the spring, early summer, it sat forever in my neighborhood. So I don't know how it is in, in others. And when I travel around the city, I do take uh, notice of how, what, how the services are. Because in some parts of the neighborhood, the, if, um, if a garbage collector drops something on the street, he'll get out with his um, uh, dustpan and broom or rake and get it up. But in my neighborhood, now if they see us standing out, yeah, he might get up and get out and uh, pick it up, but the services are not the same. So I think that if people want um, a good community, everybody ought to work together. So that's, that's my concern, the dumping, because in, out here in the Southwest, we have one street, Rinky Road. I think it has something uh, invisible that says dump here. So that's, what I'm, that's my concern. Well, uh, again, thank you for sharing that concern. Um, that's one of the things that I've been working with uh, our public works director, uh, Johnny, John Hunwell, in regards to south of 630 and east of 30 areas. Uh, he is currently working on a plan to uh, overemphasize uh, the addressing of the issues in south of 630 and east of 30, and that plan should be done by the end of this year. So that's, that's number one. Uh, number two, I do uh, want to just acknowledge that uh, the storms that have recently happened was a historic flood something that no one in the city of Little Rock uh, or central Arkansas and really majority of Arkansas ever experienced before and so we did experience a number of delays uh, because we were dealing with a historic flood uh, but as it relates to uh, systemic and uh, consistent issues that you've seen uh, I want to make sure that by the end of the night please visit with Honeywell, John Honeywell uh, and uh, for anyone many of you all have my number um, I want to know when you see it text me the picture and we will get right on it uh, because there should be no uh, change in services irrespective of where you live in the city of Little Rock as long as I'm the mayor. Thank you. Mayor, you're on 14 years from traditionally from Methadone Crack Center down to yeah. yeah. And again, what uh, Sarah was saying in addition to that increase, what we uh, are receiving with that, because you asked about additional services, we will be purchasing 14 additional uh, knuckle boom yeah. Four, 14 new positions, two knuckle boom uh, trucks that'll help pick up 14 new positions, not 14 new knuckle boom. I know John said he probably wanted to have 14. <laughs> 14 new employees, two uh, new knuckle boom trucks that we desperately need to help pick up around the city. Believe me, the $8 increase is going to be well used. It'll be well used. Yeah. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Um, and please, everyone, please state your name because this is being viewed online. For those who couldn't okay. make it out tonight, they can watch it online All right. in real time. My name is Tashan O'Neill, and I'm the president of Chico Neighborhood Association. And I'm here tonight because I agree with what you said, that we all are one city and we all should bear the brunt. Even if you don't recycle, you pay. Even if you don't have kids to go to public schools, you pay. 
Now, what I would like to say is that here in Southwest, we're going to take a brunt of the LRSD's, um, to me, responsibilities. I live off Chico and Baseline. We're going to have that new school that's going to be built out here. And we're closing down McClellan and J.A. Fair. At this new school, I don't hear anyone coming to tell us what are we going to do about the traffic. For an hour and a half, it's already busy at Bayside and Chico because you have people coming from the freeway, coming from the railroad tracks, and coming from Guy Springs. I don't see how we're going to be able to get all those buses in and out of Man Road without totally disrupting the traffic in that area. I would also like to say that they said that they're closing the schools out here because of Fs. Hall had an F rating. However, Hall's community got together and their school is staying open. One of the complaints that they had was that the kids there, the kids that are going to be taken out of Hall and put to our new high school, they used to not go to cool school and skip, which was normal. And when you skip, there was trash that was thrown about because it's going to be kids walking from that area. There's also going to be an increase in crime with breaking in homes and also cars. I haven't heard anyone talk about the extra resources that we're going to get. As a matter of fact, we fired seven of our code enforcers right there in the very area that's going to be affected because you're going to have almost 2,000 people. We don't know who catches a bus, who does it at this point because we've totally been lost out of what's going to happen with the school district other than one school's closed, another one's open. So my thing is, talking about, I heard people say we're going to widen Chico Road. I hope that's not true because we have a lot of flooding that happens in Southwest. And if any dollars are going to be sent on streets, it needs to be on fixing sewers and not widening the street for a school district that should have thought about that two years ago. So I want to ask this city, I want to ask the people here, what are you going to do because Southwest should not take the brunt of all of what's going on in Little Rock School District. I'm not against teachers, I'm not against unions, I'm for the kids. But the kids in Southwest are the ones being affected and no one's talking about the kids. No one's went to any of the schools and said, hey, we're going to combine these schools that used to be rivals, that may cause some fighting, are we going to have some extra people monitoring, are the police going to... We haven't talked about any of that. And I think that's important because Southwest is going to be bombarded. And not only that, I'm told that every public school that closes the charter school gets it. If they're not taking care of the public schools out here while they're open, Watson's four blocks from there. If that school stays open for a year, uh, closed for a year, who's going to cut the grass? Who's going to make sure it's not prostitution and crime going in there? Again, our resources doing an LRSD job. And if they close all these schools out here, those are a lot of empty buildings. Okay, they go to charter schools, these community schools. You want to take money from here. The schools have their own responsibility. We pay taxes for that. If we have money in Southwest for our children, for our community program, it needs to stay there. These are all things that they should have thought about of before. When you pack all these kids in there, it's going to be a hot mess. I said it. But we are going to be the ones to take a brunt. And I want someone to tell me, what have we done? Have you got therapists to go to the schools at JFR and McClellan and say, hey, I know you guys are anxious. I know parents are nervous. Here's the school route. Here's the bus. Have you told us in the neighborhood, there's going to be 20 new buses coming through your streets. We're going to tear up your roads. Who's going to pay for that? Well, Miss O'Neill, thank you. <laughs> no, no, Miss O'Neill, if you if you'll, you'll stay, but definitely thank you. I, and for everyone, Miss um, O'Neill, you are combining two different governing structures. Yes. To, if you want to, uh, we take our money. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just want to make sure that I accurately answer your question. Uh, so uh, number one, uh, the city of Little Rock did not decide on what schools to close. Uh, that decision was made by the State Department of Education and the Little Rock School District and Superintendent Mike Poor. Uh, so that decision was made two years ago. Uh, the schools that have been combined, J. Fair, uh, I'm just going off of memory right now, but J. Fair and McClellan will be combined to a, a, to a new state-of-the-art Southwest High School. Uh, that's somewhere more than 20 to $25 million that's being invested in Southwest Little Rock, an investment that Southwest Little Rock has not seen since my lifetime as being a resident of Southwest Little Rock. Uh, so that's number one. Uh, number two, um, you did mention Hall High School, which is labeled as the F School. Uh, it is remaining open. Uh, that school does have social workers, and Southwest High will have social workers as well to deal with uh, some of the many myriad of issues uh, that uh, many uh, students uh, encounter 
uh, here in the city of Little Rock. Um, those other schools, I believe McClellan will be combined, McClellan will become the new Cloverdale, I believe. Um, and there's some other things that are going on. So many of those buildings uh, that are receiving some closures aren't necessarily being closed as a building because other schools will move into those buildings or they will be maintained by the Little Rock School District because if they are not maintained by the Little Rock School District, yes, you are correct uh, that a charter school can uh, take advantage of that open building. Uh, but it's my understanding that none of the open buildings will uh, have a lack of usage so it won't be an opportunity for a charter school to obtain it. So I know that's some talking points that people have kind of shout out there, uh, but I, I'm here to always tell the truth uh, and what's going on based on my understanding at this point in time. So that's... But again, that's what I that's what I just said is that McClellan is going to be closed. Cloverdale is going to move to McClellan, and then there's going to be some other usage for the other vacant buildings so that a charter school cannot be obtained. That's that's the answer. Yeah. So as long as the Little Rock School District has um, has some type of a usage, whether it's a higher learning facility of some sort. Uh, there's going to be a, there's a number of different ideas, but as long as they have a usage for a vacant building, a charter school cannot obtain a vacant building. They can only obtain a vacant building. So it's my understanding that the Little Rock School District is going to make usage for additional services um, for those vacant buildings. So rest easy that those buildings won't be taken over by charter schools as long as there's not a usage for it. Well. <laughs> That's, well, that's a different thing. Um, and so, and then secondly, the reason why uh, the city of Little Rock is getting involved uh, into the Little Rock School District is because our future is based on uh, the productivity and achievement of the Little Rock School District. At the end of the day, when someone's choosing to live in our city, they're going to make a choice based on how safe they feel and can their child get a quality education. And so it is the job of the city of Little Rock, because right, wrong, or indifferent, we're going to be labeled uh, by what goes on in Little Rock School District. And along with my mayor, if I'm going to be labeled by something, I'm going to make sure I can have some type of influence in it. And so right now, the prevention, intervention, treatment dollars can be used, will be used to help our students, because that is true prevention and intervention because the, the, if a child can read, by the time they're in the third grade, they're less likely to go to, to be dead or in jail. But if they can't read by the time they're in the third grade, they're more likely. And so we're going to continue to do what we can to make investments in our children because they are our most precious assets. Is that something everyone's going to agree with? No. But I didn't sign up to, to be the yes person for everyone. I signed up to lead this city. Next question. Pam Noble from our neighborhood association. Good to see you, Ms. Pam. Good to see you. Uh, on the garden. I do want to say I love being in Southwest Little Rock. I told everyone they, was, they said it was quiet at Center University of the Park. I said you ain't been to Southwest Little Rock yet. Uh, the garbage. I yes, passed years ago. There used to be free uh, landfill day. Mm -hmm. I've asked for that for several years. The Saturday after a holiday, it's always open. Why can't we go back to that to help hinder some of the dumping that's going to take place? 100% it's going to take place. John, can you answer that? That's the, you, that's the first time I've been asked that question in my 10 months in office, so I'll ask John. Uh, Ms. Noble asked, why can't we have free landfill day? We used to have it years ago. Are you familiar? Was that before your time? In January? No, free landfill day. No. Go to Mike. But, but are you, right now we will pick if up. I have a tree that I cut down and I fill my truck bed up. The Saturday after a holiday, the landfill's open. If I show proof that I'm a legal resident of Little Rock, I can go and dump it for free. That's the way it was years ago. But they just specified, I think there was like three or four Saturdays, I don't remember a year, but I've talked with the people at sanitation at the landfill and they said they're fully staffed 
the Saturday after a holiday because they have to pick up on the Saturday. Why can't we do a Saturday landfill, free landfill, so that you can take what you've got out there? Are you talking it? yard waste tree debris? Are you talking anything, anything in general? Or anything in general. That's something I'll have to, to go back and, and talk because I'm not familiar with us ever having that program. You did. But I'm, I'm just saying, in, yeah. to my we're knowledge. Old, we're, we're older. Sure. So I, I need to, I, I would need to go back and, uh, and speak with them and, and see what decision was made to stop doing that. I don't know what other conditions existed uh, that may have uh, precipitated us not doing that any longer. So, Ms. Noble, we'll look into that and uh, okay. follow up. And since there's only a small percentage of Little Rock that recycles, correct? Uh, I don't know. No, that's 60%, 60 of Little Rock. Recycles? Okay, mm -hmm. that's higher than I thought. Okay, but we've cut down on what we can recycle. Well, waste yeah. management cut down on right. what could, down. what we could recycle, and so with that being said, um, as we shared earlier, um, that we've recently done an RFP uh, for glass recycling. We just opened up the. Uh, bidding so that will increase more, correct? If the city board agrees to it. Okay. Well, your citizens will not be happy. I can tell you that. One other question no. on the on the pickup, the Monday yard waste is that still going to be held in stamp? Continued Monday after yard January. Waste. Monday yard waste. Monday yard waste pickup. Is y'all's day is Monday? Monday. Yeah, mm -hmm. those schedules are not going to be changing. Okay, that. so that's not going to be considered in the one time a year. No, ma'am, no, ma'am. Okay. Your, your typical yard waste stuff that's, you know, we always have the dimensional uh, shorter than six feet, smaller than six inches right. in diameter. Okay. Uh, that type of material is still going to be picked still up weekly go. on the day after your trash service, okay. your garbage service. So if y'all are a Friday garbage collection, you'll be a Monday yard waste collection okay. that that's not changing at all at all okay. no ma'am it's just it's like if you had a huge tree that you cut down or you you take uh, bulky items like furniture uh, large uh, items that you pay you get one of those uh, included in your uh, rate a year and then after that if you put more material out that's where we'll come and want to talk to you about the, the fee that would be associated with picking okay. that up all right let me go a different route fleet services Yes, ma'am. If see why if, I asked you to be here, Willie. If each department takes a car in, is that de department paying for the service on that vehicle, or is it? Yes. 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 Okay. Another question: Police cars. Why are we ordering plane cars and then having to wait to get them set up for the police? Why can't we order them? Why can't we lease the cars? and have them already retrofitted with everything and when it's delivered they get in it and drive away? Actually, I think we are, but I'm going to ask Willie to kind of explain that process that you asked. Okay. Willie? You got to be at the mic. Willie is our uh, police services director. Yes, my name is Willie Hinton. Um, <laughs> and he's not the Willie Hinton's grandson or something. <laughs> I am not. That was a good question. And we can have them upfit by an upfitter before they actually get here. It will cost you $18,000 more to actually do that. Uh, are you we are leasing the unmarked cars, and we are contemplating leasing the marked cars as well. Uh, but we, uh, the last uh, 70 that we ordered, we leased them. And we're getting ready to lease another round over the, in about a week. And those are going to be leased as well. Uh, Mr. Moore has asked me to make sure that uh, we have a good plan around leasing the patrol vehicles as well. Uh, well. There was some apprehension there only because we have to upfit them so much. And the big reason to lease a car in the first place is for the residual value that you will get, it, get when you get ready to get rid of it. Uh, which is really high if you take care of the vehicle, which we're working at. But uh, I think we're probably going to lease the uh, patrol cars next year. Uh, there's a probably 75% chance that we will. Yes, Ms. Carlin. I have another question. 
Carla Coleman, our neighborhood association. <laughs> um, now we can't use plastic bags. So what is what is going to be used in place of plastic since they don't want us to use plastic anymore? Because I do know for a fact that but, but let me Let me just interject. Okay, uh, we, plastic bags. We still have plastic bags. There is a plastics bag study that has been recently passed to study whether or not the city will move away from plastic bags. Okay. So okay. when you go to, yeah, you can't put plastic. Are you asking about recycling or just usage of plastic? And garbage, and garbage. Right. But I know that Conway, Faulkner County, um, has uh, paper bags, those 50 gallon paper bags. They, they do not allow, yeah, uh, that. So that's what I wanted to know. So our garbage, y'all doing a study on the plastic bags. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you Willis, for that correction. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Dave Flowers, and <clears throat> I am a uh, employee of the city. I've, I've got a real quick question about the health care, proposed health care deal. In that deal, I understand that there will be a proposed increase in the employee's contribution for just the employee, but in there, is there also an increase in the contribution if we're paying for a family plan as well? Yes, uh, actually, uh, Stace, if you'll share that. So if, uh, and so what Mr. Flowers is sharing, there's a, if you're a single employee, you ha uh, the city would pay 100% of the health insurance. Uh, but if you're an employee in a family, I believe the city uh, primarily would pay 55%. Correct, currently. Currently, and in the new proposal. In the proposal, you are correct. Um, while the city is picking up half of the increase for the employee only, um, the entire increase for the family coverage will be borne by the um, employee picking up the family coverage. Um, there is a, a slight increase in the city contribution towards family, um, just through the nature of how the premium is billed and the fact that we're picking up half of what the employee costs would be. So those um, amounts will be shared with employees so that they can make a determination during open enrollment whether they want to stay with the, the city's insurance or possibly look elsewhere for a comparable package. So the contribution for the employee that's paying for family won't go up. You're saying what you all are paying is going to go up? No, um, we're going to pay half of the increase for you. And then when that is calculated into the family, cost it'll um, go just very slightly into the family premium but the majority of it of that 15 percent will be borne by the employee contributions yeah. and I can share that with you after this but okay. um, but that information will be shared with the employees okay and I guess the last thing kind of what you just said if we choose that we don't want to will we have the option to opt out for employee coverage yes okay all right right and so that's why it'll be important for you to attend open enrollment. Okay. And that's the, again, Mr. Flowers, you gave a great example of why there's gonna be many questions as it relates to health insurance. And so until we have a final decision that give, now gives the family opportunity to figure out what works best for them, because uh, I don't know, you may have a wife and your wife's health insurance may be better for your family versus the city's and you may make that type of decision moving forward. And so, Director Adcock, that's just a great example of the reason why we gotta make a decision first. Thank you, Mr. Flowers. Next question. Seeing no other questions, I wanted to make sure, well, let's, any more questions, any more questions? Seeing it's now 7.24, uh, we do plan, uh, there may be another uh, a meeting as we share it, you all are a great example of why we have community meetings because we listen to every question that you share. Uh, we have things that we continue uh, can work on to improve and that is the reason why you all have a voice here in the city of Little Rock and I wanted to make sure this budgeting process uh, that uh, we got to you early so you understand what's going on with the budgeting process. Again, our plan is to uh, present a draft uh, balanced budget on October the 29th. Uh, that's going to be a big meeting. Also on October 29th, we'll be voting on uh, the health insurance options uh, as well. And uh, we think 
Um, by October 29th, we'll know whether or not to provide a decision on the glass recycling as well because we just got the bids today. Um, so a lot of decisions that go into place in how we fund the city and we all operate. Um, and we're glad you are playing a major part of that. Um, Vice Mayor Wark, uh, since uh, we are in your ward, in Ward 7, I uh, want to yield the floor to give you any commentary. And I also want to continue to acknowledge that uh, City Director Ken Richardson is here, who also re represents a portion of Southwest Little Rock. Uh, Mr. Richardson, you'll sh share one. And, and City Director. This is his ward. Oh, this is your <laughs> ward. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, City Director, come up here. This is your ward. This is his ward. Well, actually, well, Vice Mayor, I'll, never mind. I'm going to let him talk. Okay. <laughs> All right. It's your ward. I forgot about that. On this, you share the you yes. share the building. Yeah, I was, yeah. I was figuring I was. <laughs> yeah, we, we we also shared the podium when we did the the railroad overpass groundbreaking. Yes. So, that. yes, I want to echo the mayor's um, comments and thoughts about everybody being here tonight. I think it's crucial that we have community involvement in all the things that we do, so that we have uh, the reality that was something we're doing with you, not to you, not at you, or for you, but something that's with you. And I think that creates a better sense of community. So I'm gonna share the put them again with Ward 72 or 27 director, <laughs> Vice Mayor B.J. Rock. This is not a ward. Don't forget that, Mayor. <laughs> it was mine, <laughs> but we redistricted, and uh, I, I, don't, I don't have a community center, Mayor. I need one. Um, I just want to thank everybody for being here tonight. Uh, it gives the staff and it gives the mayor a flavor for how thoughtful Southwest Little Rock is in regards to their questions and in regards to the desires that they want for their neighborhood. How many times did Carla Coleman get up here and ask questions? Oh my goodness. Uh, but um, everybody that lives in Southwest Little Rock uh, is very thoughtful about what they want their community to look like, what they want their neighborhood to look like, what they want their kids to do. As Deshaun said earlier, she's really concerned about the kids. So I wish we'd had more folks here tonight. Uh, it's a good representation, but I'm thankful for each and every one of you for being here and your questions. And I don't think you stumped the mayor, but it, you still could have time to do it. So anyway, thank you for being here. Thank you, Vice Mayor, for those comments. Uh, and again, uh, to echo that being a Southwest Little Rock resident, it's proud to see the type of engagement that we have uh, in Southwest Little Rock uh, today. So thank you all, uh, particularly to the community leaders and the community members. Uh, that being said, uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.